Good evening and welcome to Publish and Be Damned, Series 1, Episode 3, 52 Rules for Life Continued. So, we left off on our last stream having read the first the first half of uh, Epictetus, 52 Rules for Life. Um, I'm joined again this evening by Jack. Say hello, Jack. Hello. And if you'd like to introduce yourself for anyone that's joining us new, now or in the future. Yeah, uh, so I'm Jack. Um, and I am one of the members of the Wellington Project. I run the History Stream, um, which is going to be starting tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. UK time. So if you want to come along and watch that, then you have the opportunity to do so tomorrow. And you can see my Twitter in my name. It's at Jacks underscore W Project. And, and, and what is your stream going to be on tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow, the stream will be on Wellington himself. On the Iron Duke himself. Um, it's so, as I say, it's a history stream. So we're going to be looking at his career, both as a military man and as a politician. And it's going to be we, we want it to be a kind of casual sort of discussion rather than a lecture. Um, so feel free to come along. You know, if you want to be active in the chat, come and be active in the chat. And at the end of the stream, we'll be going through what people have been saying, see if there's anything interesting there. And if you can't watch it live, then obviously it will once it's processed, be up for people to listen to afterwards. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And if, if if people want to get a sneak peek at what's in the pipeline, they're welcome to join the Discord. The link is in the description. And, um, you know, if Jack covers one of your specialist subjects, I'm sure he'd love to have you on. To yeah, we're that. always looking for guests for that history stream. So. Brilliant. Well, hopefully this evening we may have another guest shortly. Um, Dave, if you're out there. <laughs> Looking forward to having you on, but in the meantime, we'll we'll move. Maybe on you made through. the mistake that I did and went to the wrong stream. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> Maybe I should delete the old links. But anyway, we'll um we'll move on. So this week I haven't got got an introduction, given that it's it's more of a continuation of last week. But I do have a a quote from Epictetus himself, which I thought would be nice to read and and reflect upon. So, man is not worried by real problems so much as by his imagined anxieties about real problems there is dave hello hello sorry for hello dave readiness. that's okay maybe um we'll read this again and get your reflections upon what it says and then dave you can introduce yourself so man is not worried by real problems so much as by his imagined anxieties about real problems so when I, I, I read this, I think a lot of, you know, in my role as a husband and father, I have a lot of anxieties about um, the quote unquote cost of living crisis and what that's doing to my real wages and, you know, what that might mean for the future. And, and I guess what it's saying is that uh, we spend an awful lot of time worrying about things that haven't actually happened and may never happen. And it's not healthy. Was it Seneca? I think it was Seneca who who spoke about the idea that um, control over concerns with regards to things that may be seen as misfortunate are more to do with the way that we react to them and the way that we expect them to be. So, for instance, um, the rain, you know, um, people don't get upset and have a tantrum or whatever when it starts to rain. And the reason being, we've come to expect rain. You know, it's okay. unpleasant, but it's not something that causes us to break down. And so I think that you can apply that to this quote here in that it's like, you know, there there are problems, there are real problems, um, but then there's also the way that we respond to those problems, i.e. the imagined anxieties about them. Mm -hmm. You know, I I talk to my father-in-law sometimes about money. He's retired, so uh, it, he gets to enjoy the, the benefits of being on the pension he's worked mm -hmm. for his whole life. And, uh, you know, I talk to him about you know, the recession in 2008, for example, and the cost of living crisis now. And his response is always sort of like, oh, I lived through lots of those and I'm still here. So, you know, you'll be mm -hmm. fine. And, you know, most people will be fine in the long run. Um, Dave, what's, what are your that thoughts? That sounds awfully Keynesian. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose it, it strikes me of uh, a biblical quote. Okay. 
I, I, I was saying to Jack before the stream that uh, you're probably one of the the better Christians I know, and I'm sure you'll you'll give us some Christian insights. So, uh, oh no, all all of all of sin and fallen short. Um, <laughs> no, the the one that I'm thinking of, we we would actually quote it, and I have it uh, paraphrased on my wall. It used to belong to my grandfather, and it was "Don't worry, it may, may never happen." And it's uh, Matthew is therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Probably should have read that from some old King James take, therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things itself. Sufficient on to the day is evil thereof. That's a, it's a bit like uh, last time when we talked about Seneca's death and sort of why, why cry now when every day is, you know... <laughs> Yeah, so um, what need uh, is there to weep over parts of life? The whole of life calls for tears. <laughs> Which is a, a bit of an interesting way of looking at it. But um, Dave, why don't you introduce yourself and say uh, what your understanding of Stoicism is? And... Uh, oh, right. Okay. So, hello. Uh, I am indeed Dave. I'm from Northern Ireland. And I know diddly squat pretty much um, about many things, which I think is always helpful to uh, acknowledge your faults and I've got, I've got uh, a story story about that. Um, at the start of these kind of things. But no, yes, I suppose from the Stoics, I've picked up, you know, layman's bits and pieces as you go about, but uh dipping in and out of these streams and various other bits and pieces no problem it's about well, as good I mean, as it gets from me it's, it's good years. it's good to have people who maybe aren't as familiar because they're reacting kind of live as we go through so it's you know um it's interesting it'll be interesting to get your contributions so dave i, I, I don't know if you're too familiar with the streams but i will read and we will stop or you can stop me at any point if you want to uh, comment about what what has been read and we can have a discussion and um anyone in the chat you're welcome to also comment and um we will respond to your comments where were we were we, we are on 26 27 we 27 hi right. arlo in chat right this one's uh, a bit poetic in my translation, so Jack, you might need to clear this one up a bit with yours. But um, okay. 27. As a mark is not set up for the purpose of missing the aim, so neither does the nature of evil exist in the world. So do you want me to read out mine? Uh, I think so, yeah. Let's, let's yeah. have a different translation. Um, <clears throat> it's quite similar. It's um, just as a target is not set up in order to be missed, so evil is no natural part of the world's design. Now, I read this and I reflect upon their concept of the god or gods or the universe, and I think they understand the universe as something that is ordered in such a way that whatever happens is just part of the natural function of the universe, the, the, the universe that's been set in motion by uh, events, um, they believe in the kind of constantly expanding and contracting um, universe, if you like. Um, and so what they're saying is the essence of the universe and the creation itself is not evil. It just is. Mm. Yeah. Which I suppose goes well with that opening comment, you know, th that what are the real, that what Jack said, sorry about, um, you know that all of it all requires tears you know that in mm -hmm. in of that self i think they probably both relate quite well together yeah possibly okay yeah i thought that was an interesting one when i read that the first time i didn't really know what to make of it but um so uh, that one's very uh, nietzschean so mm -hmm. almost an aphorism okay what, what does that mean for those that are uh, in the um, shape about myself so the the as in the way it's written in that it's like a, it's a short sentence that is kind of poetic in nature okay. um so it's it's pleasant to read um but it it means it's open to interpretation mm -hmm. yeah okay i get that yeah 
Okay. Uh, 28. If any person was intending to put your body in the power of any man whom you fell in with on the way, you would be vexed. But that you put your understanding in the power of any man whom you meet, so that if he should revile you, it is disturbed and troubled. Are you not ashamed of this? If any person was intending to put your body in the power of any man whom you fell in with on the way, you would be vexed, but that you put your understanding in the power of any man whom you meet, so that if he should revile you, it is just... Okay, so he's saying, basically, um, you'd be frustrated if you put your body in the power of anyone else, but you seem to put your feelings and frustrations in the power of other people. Yep. Um, it's... He spoke about this in when we were covering it in the last episode. The idea that um, we've spoken about the distinction between the mind and the body, the physical body, and he's basically saying that we should hold our minds to the same standards that we hold our physical body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Okay. This one for me is a very long one. Um, Twenty nine. Yeah, 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 it's quite it's quite long. So, uh, if you want to stop midway, um... my one is broken into chunks, so okay. it has like one, two, three, four. Yeah, it goes all the way up to seven, but okay. it's all the same. Mine isn't. <laughs> so, right. Okay, we'll go for it. Twenty nine. In every act, observe the things which come first and those which follow it, and so proceed to act. If you do not, at first you will approach it with alacrity, without having thought of the things which will follow, but afterwards, when certain base or ugly things have shown themselves, you will be ashamed. So I'll, I'll pause there. Um, I think he's saying, basically, consider what you want to do and what the consequences will yeah, follow he, basically he's, he's saying don't just jump into things without considering what the actual cost of such an action would be mm -hmm. and give it some thought and you know rather than just jumping in headfirst and then realizing actually i'm not prepared for this i mean th th this is very appropriate for i mean uh, you know uh, politics of the past i'm sure but certainly politics of today where mm. we often are given what I believe to be fairly knee-jerk responses to certain things, which if you sit and, you know, review and, and turn over those suggestions, you find that they actually have a lot of un potentially unintended consequences that might mean you would choose not to do the thing. Is this going to be the second time we talk about the Keynesians already? <laughs> Go on, you can expand on that. Oh, do we want to go down that rabbit hole? I mean, the, the Keynesian, uh, Keynes famously said, it, in the long run, we're all dead. Um, it's a very short-termist way of thinking in terms of economics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think governments have a propensity to do that. Um, in, in part because it's a democratic system and so you're elected I, for I was four literally or five about year terms. I was literally yeah. about to say the problem is democracy ensures that they're constantly chasing that next vote, which means that they want to pacify and placate the people yeah. and, and buy that vote. Dave, have you have you got... Yeah, well, I was just going to jump. I suppose to, to a certain extent, it, it's one of the reasons against term times in that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you can have a longer term then you're not having to chase it repeatedly. Whereas you look to the states and you see their presidential election, then the mid, you know, you're only there. Well, they talk about the hundred days to get anything done, and then yeah, because that's just their thought process is what can we get done before everything messes up. But that's not a good outlook to have on on anything. I think I think you're right. I think we've seen the same thing happen in this country particularly if you look at the most recent election that kind of you had the election and then you almost immediately went into covid and the ability to kind of do anything that wasn't purely reactionary to that you know 
global issue um, meant that this government's basically been awash. Mm. I, I kind of do wonder what they would have got up to had we not uh, had all that we yeah, had. Uh, maybe it was for the best. <laughs> mm. Just a, a side note, given that we are talking about Romans here, um, is uh, the term for the consul under the Roman, I mean, obviously the Roman Republic, but then also this continued under, under the Principate. I mean, the, the Roman Senate continues all the way up into Byzantine history. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one year. Mm. So they, they had single year um, terms, and yet they didn't have a lot of these problems, but which I find interesting. The, and I'm not really the, sure why. Were they not, they weren't, as far as my memory goes, weren't able to stand for re-election the next year, though? Uh, no, they, they consistently changed it. Um, and this, but, this, but your position as a senator, though, how secure was it, that? Uh, you were in the Senate for life. So um, yeah, so I mean, you've got and and your when your your annual election is that from among the senators or is that? Yes, it's so the the various senators could stand for the various assemblies, so mm -hmm. that the Senate was fixed, and then among the senators they could stand for different positions in the assembly, and the True. highest of which was the consul. It's you almost like a, a House of Lords, but without a monarch as the. The head of well, the like. in under the Republic, it was without a monarch. Although, as I say, this continued under the Principate and then sure. the Dominate and then the Tetrarchy and so on. And so, eventually, it, it did have its own form of monarch. Um, originally, it was just the first citizen, the, the mm -hmm. Princeps Civitatis, but then it became the you know the Dominus, and then Augustus became Bash Bachelaeus, I think is how you pronounce it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay, so carrying on, he says, a man wishes to conquer the Olympic Games. I also wish indeed, for it is a fine thing, but observe both the things which come first and the things which follow, and then begin the act. He must do everything according to rule, eat according to strict orders, abstain from delicacies, exercise yourself as you are bid at appointed times in heat, in cold, you must not drink cold water nor wine as you choose. In a word, you must deliver yourself up to the exercise master as you do to the physician and then proceed to the contest. And sometimes you will strain the hand, put the ankle out of joint, swallow much dust, sometimes be flogged, and after all this, you may still be defeated. When you have considered all of this, if you still choose, go to the contest. If you do not, you will behave like children, who at one time play as wrestlers, another time as flute players, again as gladiators, then as trumpeters, and then as tragic actors. So it's an analogy of the, the same thing he said before, essentially, that, you know, rather than just jumping in and being, hey, you know, I, I want to win the Olympics, you've got to stop and think of the actual cost of of actually mm -hmm. taking such an action. And is that cost to you worth whatever benefit you think you will derive from it? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, I, I mean, I know my own personality, I have a tendency to flip from kind of hobby to hobby. Um, one month I'll be a 3D designer trying to make a career of that, and then the next time a photographer or whatever. Um, I, I guess they're sort of ancillary to what I do in my day-to-day -day job, so maybe I don't feel quite so bad about it. It's not what I want to spend my life doing necessarily, but um, still I think, you know, there's something in that. If you want to get good at something, you have to invest a lot of time in that. You can't just wake up one morning and decide, that's it, mm. I'm going to I'm gonna be the next concept pianist or whatever. Hmm. Well, the reason why I, I mentioned the, the Keynesians is because the, the most famous... Kind of mainstream critique of Keynesian economics, um, as I say, the mainstream one, um, so accessible to all, would be Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. Okay. And the reason for that is because in what what Hazlitt's really trying to explain to people in that book is the concept of opportunity cost. It's he he <laughs> brings up um, Bastiat's fallacy of the broken window, which is the idea that there is the seen and the unseen cost. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, I recall that. Yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, and and so what all, all he's trying to explain there is that there's an opportunity cost in that for every action you take, there is always yeah, a cost, sure. I mean, if you can't see it, you know, in the in the accounting world, for example, you might feel that you're you need to manage your working capital. You're spending too much on inventory, and you know, you reduce your inventory. Well, what's the knock-on effect of that? If you don't reduce the right inventory, you might end up not satisfying the customer. And what's the effect of that? Well, you lose revenue, and then you're constantly chasing your tail uh, with declining revenue and too much inventory, and you never, you're never getting to where you need to get to. So, you need to assess the thing holistically. Look at it. Look at the whole picture. And understand what you're willing to change and what the effect of that will be. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, <laughs> I got to avoid constantly doing this because uh, I appreciate this isn't the history stream. Are we going to Rome again? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking, well, if we are talking about <laughs> um, the 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 Roman Republican politicians and and their faults on the short termist uh, system. They did have the, the Pontifex Maximus, um, which which relates going back to this idea of opportunity cost in Keynesian economics. This is one of the big criticisms of, of both uh, Keynesian economics and also supply side economics is um, the idea that you can get elected into power and then be like, hey, I've got power. Let's invest it in, I don't know, a, a new bridge uh, or a new motorway. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, obviously you, you can show people and you say, look, you can see this bridge, you can see this motorway, we're generating wealth. Although what you don't see is the opportunity cost, which well, is where that with, money could otherwise have been spent. I, I guess I don't want to make this too much of an economic stream, but you have this with HS2 is a prime example yeah. of this. Because yeah. along that entire route, you have people who cannot get builders to do yeah. any work because the government has outbid them and put them all to work on this HS2. And you've also got the problem with materials as well, because the government has outbid the individuals because it has the monopoly on power and, and taxation, and it's got, uh, or, you know, may as well be unending pockets. Um, and so people can't get builders and materials cost too much. And so they can't build the things that would have been useful to them hmm. because the state has decided that no, uh, we're gonna we're gonna do this thing instead because it looks good. Yeah, and and so, I mean specifically things such as bridges and roads are are the sort of things mm -hmm. that Hazlitt points out because he's he's saying look this is the obvious stuff that politicians build in order to be like hey look at this amazing new bridge I've built you know when it comes to an election and the way I link this to, to the Romans is that they had Pontifex Maximus which was the builder of bridges. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> which was lit literally this. It was it was uh, building bridges across the Tiber, um, oh, and, and building new new temples and and <laughs> all of this in the Republic in order to you know during elections and things in order to say look at the glory of Rome. What we've done, uh, yeah, with your money, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so they weren't immune. Uh, of course, Pontifex Maximus then went down um, to the emperor and then to the pope. And it's, it, I believe it, it remains to this day a, a title of the Pope. I think um, you're correct in that. Yeah. I think you're correct in that. So, uh, but that's a, a tangent. Um, yes. It, history stream <laughs> tomorrow. Sure. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So like we, we should stop talking politics, I think. Yeah. <laughs> well, we won't get finished tonight. So like the child, you will also be at one time an athlete, at another a gladiator, then a, rhetoric then a rhetorician, then a philosopher, but with your whole soul, you would be nothing at all. But like an ape, you imitate everything that you see. And one thing after another pleases you. For you have not undertaken anything with consideration, nor have you surveyed it well, but carelessly and with cold desire. Thus, someone who has seen a philosopher, and having heard one speak as Euphrates speaks, and who can speak as he does, is a question, they will to be philosophers themselves also. My man, first of all, consider what kind of thing it is, and then examine your own nature, if you are able to sustain the character. Do you wish to be a pentathlete or a wrestler? Look at your arms, your thighs, examine your loins, for different men are formed by nature for different things. Do you think that if you do these things, you can eat in the same manner, drink in the same manner, and in the same manner loathe certain things? 
You must pass sleepless nights, endure toil, go away from your kinsmen, be despised by a slave. In everything have the inferior part, in honour, in office, in the courts of justice, in every little matter. Consider these things, if you would exchange for them freedom from passions, liberty, tranquillity. If not, take care that, like little children, you be not now a philosopher, then a servant of the publicani, then a rhetorician, then a procurator for Caesar. These things are not consistent. You must be one man. Either, and I'm not sure the translation is quite correct here to use these words, but either good or bad. You must either cultivate your own ruling faculty or external things. You must either exercise your skill on internal things or on external things. That is, you must either maintain the position of philosopher or that of common person. So um, there's, there's two parts to this. There's the one part which is reinforcing what you said so far, which is essentially take time to deliberate. Um, but then the, the other thing he's saying is that when you have deliberated, then stick to what you're doing. Don't just keep jumping around from one thing to the next. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, he, he gave a big list of, of, of roles, you know, athlete, gladiator, orator, philosopher, um, you know, rather than just dabbing at each of them, you want to commit yourself to one once you've considered which one is best for you. Uh, maybe to make this biblical, um, I see something of the parable of the talents in this mm. as well. And I suppose that Dave, yeah, the, the, the phrase that, that jumped to mind was what is it when you say something of all traits, master of none? Mm. What is it? First uh, Jack, Jack of all, all trades, trades. Jack of all trades, master of none. Um, which is funny because we've now changed it that they are the jack of all trades and they do everything, but in reality, it means that they do everything poorly, but mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, and can't do one thing correctly. But then the, the original saying is that you know you should only do one thing correctly and not do everything poorly. Um, with your fingers in many pies, I suppose. What were you getting at there? So, so I was, I was relating that specifically to where he he talks about the kind of human capacity and that each of us is born different, and mm. your ability to do different things depends on what you've been born with, and therefore, instead of chasing after things that your your body, for example, he was talking about whether, you know, do you want to be a wrestler? is your body do you have the physique of a wrestler are you capable of being physically able to wrestle if mm. not you may want to prioritize uh your actual talents you know yeah. You, yeah. you've been you you by god or the universe or whatever you've been given a body and a mind that function in a specific way uh, yeah mag magnify those things yeah for sure and i think um I was having a conversation the other day about the fact that, you know, people people in general can do, anybody can do anything, but mm -hmm. there is a, is a very varied level of how well people do the thing. And I suppose, sure. you, know, you know, so you can write a book, but it could be a terrible book if you are not a good author or you, you can become an astronaut, but you could be a terrible astronaut. So I suppose you know, in reality, we don't measure whether people are able to do things. We measure whether they are good at the things that they do. So you, you can live forever, but well, most people aren't uh, very good at uh, it. And yes, uh, exactly. some people are slightly better than others. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I suppose not. But even, you know, for my own profession, that anybody, you know, could be a doctor, but you might not be good at it, you know. <laughs> then that, that would show up probably quite quickly in quite yeah. negative fashion. Yeah. You might be one of these uh, midwives that decapitates the baby. <laughs> uh, yeah, indeed. But um... there's a, there's a, there, there was a, a story, Jack, I can see your face. There was a, <laughs> a story um, a couple of years ago about uh, someone who basically should have had their child delivered by C-section and the midwife pushed ahead with uh, a natural birth and uh, the, the head came off in the birth canal. <laughs> Which is disastrous, but... Yeah. Um... Well, there's no going back from that. No, there's um, not. Although apparently she's still practicing medicine. So, uh... Is it NHS? <laughs> Don't <laughs> challenge me. Why would you ask? <laughs> of course, it's we said no politics. So. Mm. Um, 
uh, all up, the doctor may not have been trained in England. Um, number 30. Duties are universally measured by relations. Is a man a father? The precept is to take care of him, to yield to him in all things, to submit when he is reproachful, when he inflicts blows. But suppose that he is a bad father. Were you then by nature made akin to a good father? No, but to a father. Does a brother wrong you? Maintain then your own position towards him, and do not examine what he is doing, but what you must do, that your will shall be conformable to nature. For another will not damage you unless you choose, but you will be damaged when you shall think that you are damaged. In this way, then, you will discover your duty from the relation of a neighbour, from that of a citizen, from that of a general, if you are accustomed to contemplate the relations. What's he saying there, guys? So this is basically what Dave was saying a minute ago about how uh, anyone can do anything, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're good at that thing. This is saying that uh, our, our duties, um, so basically the, the way that we uh, have our responsibilities and the way that we interact with people are defined by social roles. And then he keeps going on each one. Well, you know, what if, you know, you have a certain role, to, a certain duty to your father. Oh, but what if my father's not so good? Um, you still have a duty to them. <laughs> yeah, it just you means that still they're not act good. In a way, conform yeah. to nature. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Yeah, no, a lot. Of, yeah, I think that makes sense. It makes sense. Um, although, you know, that that is very uh contrary to modern views isn't it you know i guess you know the kind of the the view that would be celebrated today would be oh your your, your father's you know i don't know transphobic for example you know denounce him cut him off you know uh, you know just dis destroy him in front of everyone so that you you appear good because that's what's what's venerated. Yes, um, it's it's very contrary to to modern thinking. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's almost it's, again. It, it's almost like the turn the other cheek mentality. Yeah, it, it, to, modern society is almost um, it's almost a sort of outrage culture, isn't it? In that mm. it's looking for faults in people and then it's playing them up. To such a degree, because uh, it's it's, it's acting in response. your own virtues by yeah shutting someone else down. It's it's acting in response to those faults because you derive some kind of pleasure from it. But of course, the Stoics would say, you know, eudaimonia is internal. You're not going to derive it from, you know, bad mouthing someone else or, or scoring a point over someone else. Hmm. And even um, we, we were saying with regards to news the other day i was talking to someone about you know it's not about accuracy it's about speed mm -hmm. and i think it's exactly the same with with this when you, you you're commenting or doing something with someone you look exactly towards that point and that's it and everything else is taken there is no context people are judged instantly by one comment rather than by a whole host of others you know, what is it i think there's a good quote in um the film Stardust, where uh, where it says uh, reputations, um, like decades to to construct and minutes to destroy mm -hmm. or something like that, and that was in two thousand and eight. And I think it's probably probably more true now than uh, <laughs> I think you're right there <laughs> that it was back then. That's not a good film. It's not really well. Well, it's, it's I watched it over lockdown. It's pretty poor, but some fun. What else was there to do? Hey, yeah. Okay, thirty-one. As to piety towards the gods, you must know that this is the chief thing: to have right opinions about them, to think that they exist, and that they administer the all well and justly. And you must fix yourself in this principle or duty to obey them and to yield to them in everything which happens and voluntarily to follow it as being accomplished by the wisest intelligence. 
For if you do so, you will never blame either the gods, uh, nor will you accuse them of neglecting you. Uh, so this isn't the, the, the rule for life finished, as it were, but um, I just wanted to, I guess, jump in there and get some thoughts on that. So it... it it's the same thing as the previous one, only rather than applying it to fathers or brothers, it's applying it to the Roman pantheon. Yes. Although, again, I think it's important to stress that I don't think the Stoics... Well, I mean, they may have differed, but I don't think they believed in the gods in, in the sense that, you know, your, your average person might have considered them, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, they're, they're, they're talking about God in the sense of something that's bigger than you, if you like. Um, anyway, uh, I'll carry on. Um, and it is not possible for this to be done in any other way than by withdrawing from the things which are not in our power and by placing the good and the evil only in those things which are in our power. For if you think that any of the things which are not in our power is good or bad, it is absolutely necessary that when you do not obtain what you wish, and when you fall into those things which you do not wish, you will find faults and hate those who are the cause of them. For every animal is formed by nature to do this, to fly from and to turn from the things which appear harmful and the things which are the cause of the harm but to follow and admire the things which are useful and the cause of the useful. It is impossible then for a person who thinks that he is harmed to be delighted with that which he thinks to be the cause of the harm, as it is also impossible to be pleased with the harm itself. For this reason also a father is reviled uh, by his son when he gives no part to his son of the things which are considered to be good. And it was this which made the Polyni uh, and it was this which made Polynices and Eteocles enemies, the opinion that the royal power was a good. It is for this reason that the cultivator of the earth reviles the gods. Uh, for this reason the sailor does and the merchant, and for this reason those who lose their wives and their children. For where the useful, uh, or where your interest is, there also piety is. Consequently, he who takes care to desire as he ought and to avoid as he ought uh, at the same time also cares after piety. But to make libations and to sacrifice and to offer first fruits according to the custom of our fathers purely and not meanly, nor ceaselessly, nor scantily, nor above our ability is a thing which belongs to all to do. That's a bit wordy. It is. Yeah, there's a few different aspects to that. So first it's talking about the idea of, of good and evil um, and saying, well, you know, it's best not to externalize things as good or evil because, I mean, in, in that specific segment, it's talking about the gods. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this, as, I, as we've said, as we said last time, the, this idea of amor fati, of love of fate, um, that, that putting connotations onto that is is only harmful. Um, and then after that, it's talking about, for instance, making sacrifices and things. Um, and it, it's not necessarily about how much or how little you give as much as it is about doing it correctly, you know, mm, the intent and the act mm -hmm. of giving. Okay. Yeah. Um, what do you think he's talking about when he says uh, it is for this reason that the cultivator of the earth reviles the gods, for this reason the sailor does, and the merchant, and for this reason those who lose their wives and children? Is is uh, I think he's saying there because they their god is they kind of made the object of their desire their god, and therefore where yeah. shall I read that section out from my book? Okay, yeah, sure. And so we find even fathers being blamed by their children. For when they fail to give them what the child regards as good. It is the same reason Polyne Polynaces and Eteocles became enemies. The idea each had it each had that it would be better to rule alone. It is why farmers curse the gods, why sailors, traders, and men who have lost wives or children curse them too. 
piety cannot exist apart from self-interest. The upshot is when you practice using desire and aversion correctly, you practice being pious. Okay. So I guess I think, yeah, I think what I was saying there may be correct. Then they, 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 what they determine to be good, they believe the gods should give them. And if the gods don't give them what they have determined to be good, they curse them. Mm-hmm. So if yeah, they don't give them a good harvest, they curse the gods. Which, it's, which it's, is then sorry. kind of, I was just going to say, I've managed to find a version of it to read along to. Um, <laughs> at the at the start of that uh, paragraph, when it talks about the, the piety towards gods, you must know that this is the chief thing, to have right opinions about them, to think they exist, and that they administer the all well and justly. Mm. So, like, the, to go further on than that, if then we they, they're cursing them and complaining when they don't provide what they think is right, does that not link to the open opening statement saying that, you know, above and beyond, there are things that th- we must acknowledge that they would be doing correctly, you know, that the, the that w- won't make sense. What is us. necessarily, what is necessarily good is not what is necessarily good for us. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, and I, I wonder what, when that says, and that they administer the all well and justly, in this version, all is capitalized, and I know those things usually mean something. So I wonder what, like you know, it's not just one thing; it's all things well and justly. It's, it's what we were saying about before about um, not externalizing good and evil. Um, yes. It's the, it's the idea that you know he, he's saying specifically about you know. Um, and so we even find fathers blamed by their children when they fail to give them what the child regards as good. You know, it's this idea that when people get something, get 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 an incentive to get angry at the gods, they're going to do so. Um, that's why he said uh, the specific line was, um, "Piety cannot exist apart from self-interest." And what he's saying is that the problem with that is that it is applying a negative connotation to something that doesn't necessarily have an objective negative connotation yeah Yeah. Um, is it the case that you know when i know various things i've read some historical fiction and about you know say caesar's about to do something and uh goes to visit the temple and kind of really hopes that he has to do it he doesn't really know if he can be bothered to do it or not but really hopes that he's going to get a good uh What's that good word? Not omen. Fine or yeah, a good omen. But it's you know he's only being pious for his own personal gain. You know, as long as it turns out correctly, he's he's only doing that just so that it, and acknowledging yeah, that, that those are the auguries. Yeah, um, I, there's a really good scene in in the show HBO's Rome when the he he wants a good omen. He wants good auguries, and so he bribes the the uh, the, the people who who do the thing so that they release the white doves in the air. <laughs> Brilliant. It's a bit of an insight into how politics probably worked in those days. <laughs> Buy the auguries off. It's um, which actually, um, I uh, sorry, I, I, I won't bother because I'll be going down a tangent. I was going to talk about the chickens in the Punic Wars, but, <laughs> but I, I won't bother. History stream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The origins of the why did the chicken cross the road? Too. It's, it is a funny, funny story. 32. When you have recourse to divination, here we go, remember that you do not know how it will turn out, unless you brought the auguries, but that you are come to inquire from the diviner. But of what kind it is, you know when you come, if indeed you are a philosopher. For if it is of any of the things which are not in our power, it is absolutely necessary that it must be neither good nor bad. Do not then bring to the diviner desire or aversion, If you do, you will approach him with fear, but having determined in your mind that everything which shall turn out is indifferent and does not concern you, and whatever it may be, for it will be in your power to use it well, and no man will hinder this. Come then with confidence to the gods as your advisers, and then when they And then, when any advice shall be given, remember whom you have taken as advisers, and whom you will be, and whom you will have neglected if you do not obey them. And go to divination, as Socrates said, that you ought, 
about those matters in which all the inquiry has reference to the result, and in which means are not given either by reason nor by any other art for knowing the thing which is the subject of the inquiry. Wherefore, when we ought to share a friend's danger or that of our country, you must not consult the diviner whether you ought to share it. For even if the diviner shall tell you that the signs of the victims are unlucky, it is plain that this is a token of death or mutilation of part of the body or of exile. But reason prevails that even with these risks, we should share the dangers of our friend and of our country. Therefore, attend to the greater diviner, the Pythian God, who ejected from the temple him who did not assist his friend when he was being murdered. Um, I feel like I have to talk about the chickens now. <laughs> Go on. So th this last bit, he's, he's saying, um, um, don't consult divination on matters that already have a, a reasonable answer. So mm. he's saying, for instance, um, if you have a duty to defend your country in war, something that, that you can reasonably understand without the need to consult the gods for. Mm -hmm. Don't go and consult the gods because they might give you a contradictory answer, um, which could cause problems. Um, which leads me to the chickens. Um, in, in ancient Rome, they had the sacred chickens that they would sometimes consult. <laughs> in, in the Punic Wars against Carthage, um, they, they were about to go into a battle and, and the general decided to consult the sacred chickens on, on whether or, <laughs> on, on whether or not <laughs> the gods favoured them in this battle. And it, it was a, a, a sea battle. Um, it was in the first Punic Wars. It was, uh, it was in the sea around Sicily. Uh, and and the, the chickens ended up basically saying, no, no. Um, Neptune doesn't favor us, and so all of the all of the soldiers are like, "Oh, we can't do it then. We we can't fight this battle." Even though they had the numbers, you know, they had more ships than the Carthaginians. Everything they had, the wind, everything favored them, and so the general was just like, "Oh, screw this! I'm not listening to the sacred chickens." So I believe, if if I remember correctly, he had the the sacred chickens drowned, <laughs> and they, they went into they, battle, and they, they didn't see that coming, did they? The chickens, <laughs> <laughs> but then they went into the battle and they lost. Okay. And so that just made everyone be like, oh, should I listen to the sacred chickens? <laughs> oh, dear. Mm. So that's a good it, example of this. <laughs> pagans, eh? Um, I suppose it's in of that because they had believed what was seen probably determined th their own fate, you know, because they they believed that they were going to lose or that they, it was not in their favour, therefore when they went in doing it. That, isn't there? Yeah, like, well, well, you would um, never know, but... And another uh, anecdote where this happened was in the Iliad. Um, Achilles sacks, uh, when he first arrives um, outside of Troy, he sacks a temple of... Is it Apollo? Ah, uh, yes. Um, um, I, I don't know, but I, I think know. it was Apollo. And, um, and then, of course, when he eventually gets killed, um, he, he is shot in his Achilles in the temple of Apollo. So mm -hmm. Apollo getting his revenge. Mm. I knew Brad Pitt does well in that. Um... <laughs> it's, it's not a bad film, is it? <laughs> no, um, <it's> <laughs> 33. Immediately prescribe some character and some form to yourself, which you shall observe both when you are alone and when you meet with men. And let silence be the general rule, or let only what is necessary be said, and in few words, and rarely, and when the occasion calls, we shall say something, but about none of the common subjects, not about gladiators, nor horse races, nor about athletes, nor about eating or drinking, which are the usual, usual subjects, and especially not about men, as blaming them, or praising them, or comparing them. If then you are able, bring over by your conversation the conversation of your associates, so that which is so that which is proper. But if you should happen to be confined to the company of strangers, be silent. Let not your laughter be much, nor your many occasions, nor uh, excessive. Not nor on many occasions, nor excessive. Refuse altogether to take an oath if it is possible. If it is not, refuse as far as you are able. Mm -hmm. Avoid banquets which are given, and and the, that's kind of again 
paralleled in in scripture you're not really meant to swear oaths um you yes be yes and you know be no yes yeah um avoid banquets banquets which are given by strangers and by ignorant persons but if ever, ever there is occasion to join in them let your attention be carefully fixed that you slip not into the manners of the vulgar or the uninstructed for if you must know that if your companion be impure he also who keeps company with him must become impure though he should happen to be pure and again quite um biblical in that the you know that the peak company and what you're around or yeah. even modern day circumstances you know oh he's fallen in with a bad lot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah no i i i noted the same same thing when i read that so take and apply the things which relate to the body as far as the bare use as food drink clothing house and slaves but exclude everything which is for show or luxury as to pleasure with women abstain as far as you can before marriage but if you do indulge in it do it in the way which is conformable to custom do not however be disagreeable to those who indulge in these pleasures or reprove them and do not often boast that you do not indulge in them yourself if a man has reported to you that a certain person speaks ill of you, do not make any defence to what has been told you, but reply, the man did not know the rest of my faults, for he would not have mentioned these only. <laughs> <laughs> it is not necessary, which is quite funny. Um, it is not necessary to go to the theatres often, but if there is ever a proper occasion for doing uh, for going. Do not show yourself as being a partisan of any man except yourself. That is, desire only that to be done which is done, and for him only to gain the prize who gains the prize. For in this way you will meet with no hindrance. But abstain entirely from shouts and laughter at any thing or person or violent emotion. And when you are come away, do not talk much about that what which has passed on the stage, except about that which may lead to your own improvement. For it is plain, if you do talk much, that you admire the spectacle more than you ought. Do not go to the hearing of certain persons' recitations, nor visit them readily. But if you do attend, observe gravity and sedateness, and also avoid making yourself disagreeable. When you are going to meet with any person, and particularly one of those who are considered to be in a superior condition, place before yourself what Socrates or Zeno would have done in such circumstances, and you will have no difficulty in making proper use of the occasion. When you are going to any of those who are in great power, place before yourself that you will not find the man at home, that you will be excluded, that the door will not be open to you, that the man will not care about you. And if, with all this, it is your duty to visit him, bear what happens, and never say to yourself that it is not worth the trouble. For this is silly and marks the character of a man who is offended by externals. In company, take care not to speak much and excessively about your own acts or dangers. For as it is pleasant to you to make mention of your own dangers, it is not so pleasant to others to hear what has happened to you. Take care also not to provoke laughter, for this is a slippery way towards vulgar habits and is also adapted to diminish the respect of your neighbours. It is a dangerous habit also to approach obscene talk. When then anything of this kind happens, if there is a good opportunity, rebuke the man who has proceeded to this talk. But if there is not an opportunity, by your silence at least, and blushing, an expression of dissatisfaction by your countenance, show plainly that you are displeased at such talk. This man be not very good banter, I think. <laughs> <laughs> He's not a fan of banter, no. No, no, he doesn't like it. Um... But a lot of what of wisdom in that, you know, in that, I think definitely silence is an important thing that we don't uh, utilize quite well. Again, yes. we like to to say things and say them quickly and without thought. There's a lot to unpack in there, isn't there, around mm. excessive um, speaking, excessive laughter, um, what is appropriate in relation to. Um, you know, wedlock outside and inside of um, vulgarity. Uh... But even by his by his own uh, kind of rates for that, where it is, uh, do not, however, be disagreeable to those who indulge in these pleasures or reprove them, and do not often boast that you do not indulge in them yourself. Which, by that kind of statement, 
what he is that the whole paragraph or the whole um i don't know what you refer to this as in my ignorance chapter chapter, chapter. Yeah. um like within all of that it's you know very much but don't do these things but don't tell people off for not doing them you know, uh, it's one of those that's kind of impossible isn't it because yeah. it's like <laughs> There's no way for him to write it down without well, sounding like a hypocrite. Yes. I think I think he's saying what he's trying to say is, uh, I mean, particularly with the one around pleasure with women inside and outside of marriage is, uh, you know, the end part I think is the key, like the not boasting about it mm. and not indulging in it yourself. And then I think as well when you add in that the very final paragraph where he's saying, you know, just demonstrate by your action the whole action speak louder than words um, yeah you know uh, you, you're probably not going to change their mind by speaking and you're probably going to end up making yourself out to be overly pious and you know just end up being dismissed anyway but if you live a life that is conformable to nature and you the result is that you you have this eudaimonia that others lack they will recognize that in you and they may inquire of you Mm. Yeah, and I think even that um, the way he puts all this across in that try not to do these things, but then if you do have, if you are required to, you know, that don't go into a, a party unless you have to. But then I, I do appreciate that because there are just like Boris Johnson. Yes, yeah, indeed. There are some situations in which we do find ourselves that we would prefer not to be in the situation, but then it's very much you know, do the minimum amount that needs to be done and is required of you to... Yeah, don't, don't, don't participate any more than you need to. Yeah. Other than the situation requires, yeah. Yeah, interesting one. Quite a long one. Um, and, and probably one of the more practical ones, actually, I think. Mm. That that's a statement about um, the going to the, the theatre, but then abstain entirely from shouts and laughter mm -hmm. at anything or person or violent emotions. Quite um, topical. The Romans weren't violent at all in their uh, their love of <laughs> of wild animals. And I think the theatre was relatively unviolent. No, no, it is true. The theatre in those days was very obscene. Mm. So obviously, as I have mentioned many times, actors well, were, were not held in particularly high regards in those days. Mm. Which is always funny then when Nero yeah. uh, goes yes. and... Well, that's one of the criticisms of him, isn't it? And then Yeah, well, I, actually, one of the potential arguments historians give is that actually um, he he didn't have much interaction at all with any actors. It's just that in order to after his death, make out how bad he was, they they said that he did. You know? <laughs> um, mm. Because that's how low people thought of, of actors in those days. There was, um, there is that the case where he did um, perform in a play, though, is that not? Well, uh, su supposedly. A, lot, uh, of, okay. a lot of what was written about these emperors was written after Afterwards. the event. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, what we know usually after, Nero... they were, after they were dead to avoid any repercussions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, lo a lot of what we know from Nero is from Suetonius. It Suetonius, was, the 12 yeah. Caesars, yeah. Yeah, um, and he was a, a while afterwards. Yes. And he was a bit of a sensationalist. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so take take whatever you read in. He's, he's, he's an interesting read, though. This, despite I think, I, I studied him in college. I had to do an essay on him. But um, mm -hmm. what I recall is he's he's very typical in the sense that he spends a good deal saying how he he he's tried to make sure he's avoided any bias and you know, and it's like as soon as someone's writing that, you know, it's going to mm -hmm. be biased. <laughs> Although what what I will say is that um, you have Nero who's accused of all this stuff, and you have Caligula who's accused of mm -hmm. all the all of the nonsense that he's accused of, and and Commodus um, pretending to be Hercules, um, <laughs> but then Domitian who was also uh, written out of the histories, and and he was really treated quite awfully by the senatorial class who wrote about him after he died um mm. isn't he isn't spoken of in this sort of light mm -hmm. um and and 
engaging with these people. So either they didn't think Domitian was really that bad, or um, maybe this stuff was true about Nero. So. That's possible. Um, 34. If you have received the impression of any pleasure, guard yourself against being carried away by it. But let the thing wait for you and allow yourself a certain delay on your own part. Then think of both times, of the time when you will enjoy the pleasure and of the time after the enjoyment of the pleasure, when you will repent and will reproach yourself. And set against these things how you will rejoice if you have abstained from the pleasure and how you will commend yourself. But if it seem to you seasonable to undertake or do the thing, take care that the charm of it and the pleasure and the attraction of it shall not conquer you, but set on the other side the consideration how much better it is to be conscious that you have gained the victory. So again, sort of like, assess the consequences of your actions and, mm. you know, make that determination in advance. Have you guys seen this kind of social experiments they do where they, like, get a bunch of, of children yes. and they put, like, sweets in front of them? And they say, oh, you can have one now or two... Yeah, it, yeah. Um, it, it, it's like if you if you don't eat this for however many minutes, then you can get double. And uh, and it, you know it's interesting to watch how many of them are able to resist the temptation. Just just go straight for the sweet. Go licking, just licking the the one. And A surprising it. amount of them do. You, you'd think you know because I mean obviously it wouldn't work so much with adults because adults have developed um, to the point where they'd say, well, obviously I've only got to wait a few minutes and I get more. But but with children, they they're more impulsive. Uh, mm -hmm. And so a lot of them do just well, grab. I mean, know. we we do have this evolutionary inbuilt, like, you know, food is very hard to come by. So when you get an opportunity to take some, just take it. Yeah, well, this is all the the. I mean, we're falling into economics again, but this is all of the science behind um, uh, time preference. Mm. Low time um, preference, high time preference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Thirty five. When you have decided that a thing ought to be done and are doing it, never avoid being seen doing it, though the many shall form an unfavourable opinion about it. For if it is not right to do it, avoid doing the thing. But if it is right, why are you afraid of those who shall find fault wrongly? No, don't worry too much about what other people think. If, it's, if what you're doing is the right thing, get on and do it. Don't worry about what anyone else thinks. Which... Uh politicians could appreciate um a whole lot more if they you know just go for it well, 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 justify well, this what is doing if you think it's right well this is because they prioritize the external over the internal mm. uh, which is the whole point of this <laughs> um, uh, yes okay um 36 as the proposition is either day or it is night is of great importance for the disjunctive argument. Sorry, I'm going to start again. As the proposition, it is either day or it is night, is of great importance for the disjunctive argument, but for the conjunctive is of no value. So in a symposium, to select the larger share is of great value for the body, but for the maintenance of the social feeling is worth nothing. When then you are eating with another, remember not to look only to the value for the body of the things set before you, but also to the value of the behaviour towards the host which ought to be observed. I don't eat your host out of house and home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's just yeah, uh, uh, it's saying yeah. keep, keep context in mind, essentially. Yeah, it's if if you are a guest at someone's house, then yeah, as you say, don't don't just eat everything and leave them with nothing. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess is is there is there a deeper meaning there um, in relation it, to life I, in general? I think that it just means you know always keep in mind context, mm -hmm. of whatever whatever it is you may be me doing. Okay, d yeah, do not do the thing which seems necessarily to be immediately the most good, but consider, yeah, as you say, the context. Hmm. Um, f feeding yourself might be good, but it has additional consequences, potentially. Um, 37, if you have assumed that the character, if you have assumed a character above your strength, you have both acted in this manner in an unbecoming way, and you have neglected that which you might have fulfilled. 
My one is a simpler translation. Let's go for it. If you undertake a role beyond your means, you will not only embarrass yourself in that, you miss the chance of a role that you might have filled successfully. Mm, that is good. I like that. I think that's good. I think that's very true. Yeah, because I think in general people think, oh, we should always go for whatever the biggest thing is. But in reality, there is a... Not that you should always go for what you can do and... It is you know there's you should always be aiming above and be pushing yourself but we, we like, talked if about you've got that. one leg then don't be signing up for the 100 meters in the olympics you know <laughs> we, we we talked about interviews last week because it's what i'm looking at at the moment and um I, I i find it interesting and i have been in the position as the interviewer in the past i find it interesting um people who write checks that they can't cash they very quickly get sussed out and you know i've i've possibly missed out on jobs because i'm i'm very honest about what i can do and what i can't do um, mm. or what i can't yet do and it may be the case that people who are willing to mislead get offered the role but ultimately and this has happened a couple of times recently they they don't stay in the role very long um <laughs> I've seen quite. I've seen about two or three of the jobs I've applied for in the last sort of six, twelve months come back on the market in very short order, after having lost out on them myself. So it's uh, made me chuckle, but uh, not too much because too much laughing is bad. Mm. <laughs> Gives you uh, wrinkles. That's maybe maybe this is what he was caring about, you know. That's true. That's but that's true. external, needs, not internal. He just needed some Botox. Um, Thirty-eight. In walking about, as you take care not to step on a nail or to sprain your foot, so take care not to damage your own ruling faculty. And if we observe this rule in every act, we shall undertake this act with more security. So, yeah, no, totally logical. Um, take more care over life, your mind, just as you would your body. Yep. Um, 39. The measure of property or possessions is to every man the body, as the foot is of the shoe. If then you stand on this rule, you will maintain the measure, but if you pass beyond it, you must then of necessity be hurried, as it were, down a precipice. As also in the matter of the shoe, if you go beyond the necessities of the foot, the shoe is gilded, then of a purple colour, then embroidered. For there is no limit to that which has once passed the true measure. Um, so it's just saying, you know, when it comes to material possession, just keep them within the limitations that you actually need, as opposed to going beyond that. Yeah, because once you get beyond a certain point, you're just gilding the lily. And you're yep. you're spending a lot of time doing stuff that has very little value. Yeah, shoes with gold heels, purple pumps, or even embroidered slippers. Yeah. As he puts. Oof. And of course, gosh. you know we'll, we'll come across purple quite a lot because purple in in the ancient world is notoriously uh, difficult to color of royalty. Yes, mm. purple and blue. That's why Mary Magdalene probably didn't wear blue. It's mm. too expensive. And silk also. Maybe getting a, a purple silk. Or... <laughs> okay. I think Number... he just like, exploded half of the ancient uh, world's mind. <laughs> yeah, well, the, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going off topic. <laughs> Number four. The, the, the Byzantines had a, they stole the, the silkworm from the Far East and, and kept a monopoly on the trade. Okay. That's interesting. 40. Women forthwith from the age of 14, uh, I denounce this, uh, are called by the men mistresses. Therefore, since they see that there is nothing else that they can obtain, but only the power of lying with men, they begin to decorate themselves and to place all their hopes in this. It is worth our while then to take care that they may know that they are valued 
for nothing else than appearing being decent and modest and discreet. And Harry and would like this because this is basically simp for real queens. But no, but, but yeah, but it's the fourteen-year-old. Yeah, so I suppose you said denying it because it's starting I, at fourteen. Yeah, he, he but... did get banned from Town of Salem for a certain reason. I know this is politically um, correct at the time. Uh, I do understand that. Um, but yes, yeah. no, no, I, I agree. But, but no, the, the the important thing there is not. Strictly speaking, yeah, in, age in that but, context. It's it's the so idea. In, that... in order to be a lady, it's you also need to have some self respect and modesty. Yeah. Is what he's and saying. It, it to a certain extent does ring true to what is going on in today's society. Society, but how people view. We live in a society. Society, yeah, so but you, even you new know, modern things like OnlyFans. F- yeah, well, feminism in in its sense, you know do what you want no but it's not that it's not that they only think that it's for themselves for men it's because it's to do with themselves rather than it's they they're told it's liberating yes yes so it becomes the thing that is liberating even though it isn't Hmm. it becomes a thing that is thought of as liberating you know in in reverse instead because men traditionally would have slept around and not traditionally, but you know, it's one of those things that guys, culture, men, oh well, if they can do it, why can we not? But in reality, it should yes. be attempting to correct and curtail uh, back into guess, what is written the, here with Duke I Tribe. Guess the history, going. Sorry, Dave. I no, guess the right. historical context around that is that, um, you know, men aren't the ones left carrying the baby. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, you know, through birth control and so on. Yeah, uh, I'm not saying that that's good of men that they did that, but I'm saying that that's a, a reality, um, and that the advent of birth control has has meant that rather than women having to be picky and choosy about who they choose to sleep with and and involving themselves only with people that they would consider for you know uh, fatherhood potential and so on they're able to also do much the same thing. And it's bad for society. It's, it's, I, don't, I really don't think it's good for society. And I'm, again, I'm not saying that it's good for men to sleep around. I'm absolutely not saying that. But I'm saying the check and balance that existed of, of, of women having to choose appropriate spouses and partners uh, to raise families with no longer exists. And that is a bad thing. Mm. Yeah, I think you are correct. And uh, we've got a cat joining us. We do. This is Socks. So, hello, Socks. What, what's your opinion, Socks? I've got a good one for you now. Um, oh, no, I haven't. Not yet. I'll get to that. Um, 41. It is a mark of an incapacity to spend much time on things which concern the body, such as much exercise, much eating, much drinking, and much easing of the body, much copulation. But these things should be done as subordinate things, and let all your care be directed to the mind. Um, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. 42. When any person treats you ill or speaks ill of you, remember that he does this or says this because he thinks that it is his duty. It is not possible then for him to follow that which seems right to you, but that which seems right to himself. Accordingly, if he is wrong in his opinion, he is the person who is hurt, for he is the person who has been deceived. If a man shall suppose the true conjunction to be false, it is not the conjunction which is hindered, but the man who has been deceived about it. If you proceed then from these opinions, you will be mild in temper to him who reviles you and say on each occasion, it seems so to him. Yeah, uh, he's saying there that, again, if if someone speaks ill of you, the harm is to them and not to you because mm. they're the ones who are, I mean, if they're right, then they're right. But if they're not right, then they're the ones that are harmed because they're wrong. Yep. That's very <laughs> true. Very simple. 43. Everything has two handles, the one by which it may be born and the other by which it may not. If your brother acts unjustly, do not lay hold of the act by that handle wherein he acts unjustly, for this is the handle which cannot be born. But lay hold of the other, that he is your brother, that he was nurtured with you, and you will lay hold of the thing by the handle which it can be born. Um, what's so, he saying? 
I find that the handle thing is, he, he thinks it's simplifying it. I think that it's just confusing things more. What he's essentially saying is there are some things that you can, that, that you can let go of and, and just, you know, for instance, if someone wrongs you, there are some people that you just let them go. And there are other people that you, you keep them around. For instance, if your brother, if he mistreats you because he's your brother, um, you, you know, and because you grew up together, rather than just letting him go, you you keep him around and you try to, to just mm -hmm. make things better. Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> Possibly. Possibly. Is I wonder why he uses that analogy of the handle there. I, I think he's talking about, like, there's one handle that you can keep hold of and there's another that is insupportable. Mm -hmm. So, you know... There's... Or, or, yeah, there, there's no value to... There, your brother may act unjustly. There's no value to holding on to that. So, uh, again, I guess it's, you know, if we're looking to biblical terms, it's sort of forgiveness and, uh, you know, un understanding what's what's causing you harm the emotion about the thing is what's causing you harm because the thing's already happened it's been and gone um it can't do any more harm to you other than what's already happened and now it's all just about what you think in your head um mm. maybe is it is it that quote we had at the start um yeah it's it's your anxiety imagined anxieties about the problem um were you going to say something dave I was I was just going to say I, I almost I wonder why he used the concept of handles and whether that made more sense contextually for something um, amphora I suppose you know yeah I, given, I think you know jugs that as we knew them would have come with two handles rather than one or you know were transported large amounts of water or, is amph amphora is that how you pronounce the word yeah. for so whether it's you know that one is actually used and there's another one that's mm. there that's not yeah i don't know i am might uh, just be reading my thing but it. yeah but i think but it you... does make sense that there's things that you know it's almost too it's not worth getting involved in it's mm. that far gone um okay well 44. These reasonings do not cohere. I am richer than you, therefore I am better than you. I am more eloquent than you, therefore I am better than you. On the contrary, these rather cohere. I am richer than you, therefore my possessions are greater than yours. I am more eloquent than you, therefore my speech is superior to yours. But you are neither possession nor speech. Hmm. Again, the sen sense of perspective, I think. Yeah, I think that one's fairly self-explanatory. Yeah. Um, th th this is the one for socks. Um, 45. Does a cat bathe quickly? It doesn't say cat, it says man. Does a man bathe quickly? Uh, do not say that he bathes badly, but that he bathes quickly. Does a man drink much wine? Do not say that he does this badly, but says say that he drinks much wine. For before you shall have determined the opinion about how you know whether for before you shall have determined the opinion, how do you know whether he is acting wrong? Thus it will not happen to you to comprehend some appearances which are capable of being comprehended, but assent to others, but to assent to others. So again, don't... So, you know, don't judge people for assign value doing things until... Because you don't know the context, essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if someone's there drinking themselves to death, then don't judge them for it because you don't well, know why uh, they're doing that. I don't think it's necessarily... Some... I suppose yeah. the first one, does a man bathe quickly? What, what that, you know, is it that by doing that, has he done a bad job of him bathing and what's the point of doing it at all? But it's do not say that he baths badly, but that he ba bathes quickly. quickly. But, you know, don't... Just because he does something, he could be perfectly clean after he has done that. But don't therefore ascertain that for you yourself to have done that quickly, you wouldn't be clean. He I might be it, in a different situation. I think it's yeah. probably be accurate. Don't. Mm. The, the key line, I think, is until you know their reasons, how do you know that their actions are vicious? Okay, there you go. So yours is slightly 
word is slightly different, so it provides a bit more context, I think. Because mine says, for before you shall have determined the opinion, how do you know whether he is acting wrong? So I guess, yeah, they're saying the same thing. Yeah. No, I think we carry on. Um, 46. Uh, on no occasion call yourself a philosopher and do not speak much among the uninstructed about theorems, but do that which follows from them. For example, at a banquet, do not say how a man ought to eat, but eat as you ought to eat. For remember that in this way, Socrates also to altogether avoided ostentation. Persons used to come to him and ask to be recommended by him to philosophers, and he used to take them to philosophers. So easily did he submit to being overlooked. Accordingly, if any conversation should arise among uninstructed persons about any theorem, generally be silent for there is great danger that you will immediately vomit up what you have not digested. And when a man shall say to you that you know nothing, and you are not vexed, then be sure to say that you have begun the work of philosophy. For even sheep do not vomit up their grass and show to the shepherds how much they have eaten. But when they have internally digested the pasture, they produce externally wool and milk. Do you also show not your theorems to the do you also show not your theorems to the uninstructed, but show the acts which come from their digestion? So I think that links with what we read earlier, um, that yeah. big long one about, you know, parties and, uh, you know, laughter and, and so on. It's about... Actions speak louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. Yeah. Yeah, very simple. Very simple. Um, 47. When at a small cost you are supplied with everything for the body, do not be proud of this. Nor if you drink water, say on every occasion, I drink water. But consider first how much more frugal the poor are than we, and how much more enduring the labour. And if you ever wish to exercise yourself in labour and endurance, do it for yourself and not for others. Do not embrace sta statues, but if you are ever very thirsty, take a draught of cold water and spit it out and tell no man. Um, so, do things not for the sake of being able to boast that you're doing them, mm -hmm. but because they actually benefit you. Do things for yourself, mm -hmm. and not for others, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, do not embrace statues? Uh, there is a little, on my one, there's a little number nine next to it okay. um but i am unsure where because it's not at the bottom of the page it's it might be in the notes in the Hold on. notes here yeah. do not embrace statues but if you're ever very thirsty take a draft of cold water and spit it out and tell no man number nine don't embrace marble statues outdoors naked in cold weather a bizarre and showy kind of austerity practiced by Diogenes and other cynics. Oh, uh, I see. Okay. Sure. It's, it's, it's the same deal. Just um, yeah. do, do things for their purpose and not for showing off or trying to convince. Well, yeah. Act because you have determined it good not because of what you think other people might think of it. Um, 48, we're nearing the end. The condition and characteristic of an uninstructed person is this. He never expects from himself profit nor harm, but from externals. The condition and characteristic of a philosopher is this. He, expe he expects all advantage and all harm from himself. The signs of one who is making progress are these. He censures no man, he praises no man, he blames no man, he accuses no man, he says nothing about himself, as if he were somebody, or knew something. When he is impeded at all, or hindered, he blames himself. If a man praises him, he ridicules the praiser to himself. If a man censures him, he makes no defence. He goes about like weak persons, being careful not to move any of the things which are placed before they are firmly fixed. He removes all desire from himself, and he transfers aversion to those things only of the things within our power which are contrary to nature. Uh, he employs a moderate movement towards everything, whether he is considered foolish or ignorant, he cares not, 
and in a word, he watches himself as if he were an enemy and laying an ambush. Um, this is where um, a Northern Ireland accent would come in. I feel like he, he would be saying to himself, watch yourself. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's look out for yourself and make sure that you, again, it's 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 what we've been talking about, what you think of yourself, not what other thinks of you. And therefore, mm -hmm. if what you think about yourself is what's key, then why, do you, why should you be passing comment on others for ever, anything else? Um, you know, why do you, should you accept praise or, you know, I think it's okay. quite interesting. 49. When a man is proud because he can understand and explain the writings of Chrysippus, say to yourself, if Chrysippus had not written obscurely, this man would have had nothing to be proud of. But what is it that I wish? To understand nature and to follow it. I inquire, therefore, who is the interpreter, and when I have heard that it is Chrysippus, I come to him, the interpreter, but I do not understand what is written, and therefore I seek the interpreter, and so far there is yet nothing to be proud of, but when I shall have found the interpreter, the thing that remains is to use the precepts, or the lessons. This itself is the only thing to be proud of, but if I shall admire the exposition, what else have I been made uh, unless a grammarian instead of a philosopher, except in one thing, that I am explaining Chrysippus instead of Homer. When, then, any man says to me, read Chrysippus, to me, I rather blush, when I cannot show my acts like to and consistent with his words. Uh, so, he's saying, at first he's saying, don't be proud because you can understand a complicated text um you know if if the text had been written in a simpler manner then you wouldn't need to feel so proud mm -hmm. um and then it's talking about um the idea that when there is a, a text that's written in a complicated manner then rather than interpreting directly you know the ideas in your own manner you're you are interpreting their interpretation of the mm -hmm. ideas of uh of whatever it is um and so in this case he's basically being critical of overly complicated texts okay and yeah. then it's better to to directly interpret the simpler things mm -hmm. okay 50 whatever rules are proposed to you for the conduct of your life abide by them as if they were laws as if you would be guilty of impiety if you transgressed any of them and whatever any man shall say about you, do not attend to it, for this is no affair of yours. How long will you then still defer, thinking yourself worthy of the best things, and in no matter transgressing the distinctive reason? Have you accepted the theorems which it was your duty to agree to, and have you agreed to them? What teacher then do you still expect that you defer to him in the correction of yourself? You are no longer a youth, but already a full-grown man." If then you are negligent and slothful and are continually making procrastination after procrastination and proposal after proposal and fixing day after day after which you will attend to yourself, you will not know that you are not making improvement, but you will continue ignorant and uninstructed, both while you live and till you die. Immediately then think it right to live as a full grown man and one who is making proficiency and let everything which appears to you to be the best to you uh, a law which must not be transgressed. And if anything laborious or pleasant or glorious or inglorious be presented to you, remember that now is the contest, now are the Olympic Games, and they cannot be deferred, and that it depends on one defeat and one giving way that progress is either lost or maintained. Socrates in this way became perfect in all things improving himself, attending to nothing except to reason. But you, though you are not yet a Socrates, ought to live as one who wishes to be a Socrates. So there's four parts to this. Okay. The first part is saying, um, you know, whatever your aim in life happens to be, um, just make sure you stick to it and don't pay attention to, to anyone else, um, which we've covered before. Um, then the next part he's saying... 
you know, basically you, you have to be able to demand the best from yourself and to have basic principles and be disciplined with those principles. So this is once again, falling into the more practical advice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't keep making up excuses. Um, you know, make sure you are actually making yeah, progress. There's this element, which is like, you're a man, so live as a man. When you've decided to do something, do it. Yeah, yeah. you're, you're a grown man already, not a child anymore. And then the third part is, um, yeah, oh yeah, it's the same thing, basically. It's, mm -hmm. um, you know, finally decide that you are an adult who's going to devote the rest of your life to making progress. Um, and once again, he keeps talking about this idea of having this, this kind of, this law of principles to adhere to that you have to make yourself. Um, and no matter what crisis you might face, you know, however painful it may be or however nice it may seem, don't let that hinder you from whatever your goal happens to be. And then he starts talking about Socrates and, and about how this is what he, he used to do, meeting every challenge. And whilst you're not yet Socrates, you can be him, which... Uh, if you live as one who wishes to be him, yeah. Yeah, uh, which, which Nietzsche would be turning in his grave over <laughs> as a, a big critic of post-Socratic philosophy. Okay. Um, penultimate, 51. The first and most necessary place or part of philosophy or in philosophy is the use of theorems. For instance, uh, that we must not lie. The second part is that of demonstrations. For instance, how is it proved that we ought not to lie? The third is that which is confirmatory of these two and explanatory. For example, how is this a demonstration? For what is a demonstration? What is consequence? What is contradiction? What is truth? What is falsehood? The third part is necessary on account of the second, and the second on account of the first, but the most necessary, and that on which we ought to rest, uh, is the first. But we do the contrary. We spend our time on the third topic, and all our earnestness is about it, but we entirely neglect the first. Therefore we lie, but the demonstration that we ought not to lie, we have already at hand. So an, an analogy, if we were to use the basic scientific method, mm -hmm. would be in, in the scientific method, you have your hypothesis, the thing yes. you're trying to prove. So that would be in, you know, if we were to create an analogy, that would be the first step in this. Then the second step would be the evidence. Mm -hmm. And then the third step, and this is the thing he's focusing on, is what's the link between the two? How do you know that that evidence correlates with that hypothesis? Mm -hmm. um, and he's saying that, you know, in, in this instance, um, saying, you know, the first step is you have your principles. So, for instance, do Don't. not lie. Yeah. And then the, the second step is, you know, the, 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 the evidence uh, behind this. Um, why if you should... lie, something bad might happen. We might yeah. be caught out. Yeah. So why shouldn't you you lie essentially? And yeah, as you say, that, that something bad might happen because of it. And then the, the third aspect of this is trying to link the two of them together. So mm -hmm. why is it that this bad thing happening is as a result of lying? Um, and because... and it's it's trying to bridge this this gap and he's saying that this is what all of our attention fixates over um and then the, the last line is it uh, the result is that we lie but have no difficulty proving why we shouldn't so essentially we find it easy to to justify things without necessarily adhering to principles yeah i i guess i guess if we go into this so the, the like you say the principle is we shouldn't lie why shouldn't we lie because it upsets people um you know, it's not necessarily a good thing. Good things don't necessarily result from it. And, and and therefore, the linking of the two as well, you come to this false conclusion that, therefore, basically don't get caught in a lie. Hmm. And yeah. it's, you don't conclude that, well, I shouldn't lie. You spend all your time focusing on trying not to get caught lying yeah. rather than trying not to lie. Yeah. So, um yeah, as, as, he, as he says, we, we have no difficulty proving why we shouldn't. Mm. Um, the result is that we do. Mm. Yeah. Okay. 
52, finally, in everything or circumstance, we should hold these maxims ready to hand. Lead me, O Zeus, and thou, O destiny, the way that I am bid uh, by you to go. To follow, I am ready. If I choose not, I make myself a wretch and still must follow. But who so nobly yields unto necessity, we hold him wise and skilled in things divine. And the third also, O Crito, if it so pleases the gods, so let it be. Anetius and Miletus are able indeed to kill me, but they cannot harm me. And that is the end of the Enchiridion. I've decided to use the Greek names. Okay. Zeus instead of Jupiter. Hmm. Just, uh, you know, <laughs> it doesn't really make any difference. But... So, maybe day, day first, you've, you've, um, you came in for the second half of those mm -hmm. 52 rules for life. What did you, and, and again, you come at this, I, I don't think you've read much of the Stoics. No, no. So, um... what, what was your opinion of, what you read, do you feel like it's, uh, I'll ask the question, do you feel like it's a complete philosophy or do you feel like it's It's maybe, a, you know, could be an ancillary part or, or maybe it doesn't have any value at all and what you find there could be found elsewhere? What's your views? I think, I think, well, I'll start off with, I suppose, I think it is interesting to, to see how many aspects make sense both then and now. You know, so many things that we can see parallels with and see virtue in following um, when they were originally written and then also deny. And I think that the, the parallels that we have drawn throughout it about looking at uh, Christian literature and looking at, at, at biblical work, um, you know, evidently a lot of the people that did contribute to the, to the, the writing of the New Testament were aware of a lot of these kind of things that were learned people. So Absolutely. Um, to a certain extent, you can see where not they got the ideas from, but you know, you wonder if they built upon some of them as well. Mm -hmm. um, not that that takes away from the divine inspiration of scripture as we would believe it, but you know, to a certain logic in of itself, Christians would believe is a, a God given gift and therefore to apply it is a a, a good thing. Um, well, I, I guess uh, one of the things I was kind of always taught is that uh, all all truth is of God, and therefore, yeah. regardless of where you find it, it is still true. Yeah, and therefore, uh, still of God. I think I think plenty of uh, people could appreciate a lot of what is written in in this on a regular basis. Um, and, yeah, I kind of want, well, might have a look through some of the other ones. Now that I've got them written in front of me. Great. Um, you are more than welcome to come on any of the other shows. This, no. this is going to be a long, long running series. So, uh, um, before I get into that, though, um, Jack, same, same sort of questions to you, I guess. Um, obviously, more from uh, as someone who has. Uh, come across this stuff before, read into it in detail, understands the history and, and the kind of context. What, what's your view on whether this is kind of like a, a complete philosophy? Is this something that's valuable in the present day? Um, yeah, well, let's, let's go with that. Like I said at the start of uh, last episode, what I like about Stoicism is that it is practical. Um, it, you know, the, all philosophy has its purpose, but anyone could pick up, you know, anyone could pick up this by Epictetus, or certainly a lot of people do pick up meditations, mm -hmm. and also my Seneca letters, uh, letters from a Stoic, which is my favorite personally. Um, and anyone can pick these up and, and find you don't have to agree with every aspect of these works, but you can find something in there that will make you, at, le at the very least, look at things differently. Um, and I'd say I, on the subject of not necessarily agreeing with everything, I, I think one of the most important aspects of reading this and studying the Stoics is could, rather than just reading it and taking it as, as fact, it, is analyzing it yourself and thinking, do I agree with this? 
Mm. Um, and and then walking away. I mean, there are there are various parts that I agree with more than others. For instance, mm -hmm. um, I in particular with the Stoics, I like the the idea about um, attempting to develop a kind of mental strength by almost forcibly putting yourself into positions where you're able to resist pain or temptation or whatever, you know, whatever it may be. I find that's st that sort of stuff, uh, especially in its practical terms, more useful. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are other things that I don't agree with. So I was going to ask, what do you, what do you, what do you dissent from? Um, one of the things I know that this is all about the, the individual, but I do think that one of the, the things that the Stoics give less heed to is that there are certain realities with regards to interacting with others in the world. Um, they, they have a concept of the the state or, or almost a lack of state. They're, they're much more, <laughs> I think you could probably call them globalists in the modern sense. Yes. Um, I, mean, I mentioned in the last stream that Hegel does a good job at bridging the individual with the external. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, as I say, if people can stomach Hegel, then his elements of the philosophy of the right really put this together. And I think that this is one of the areas that the, the Stoics are lacking and that um, it's very individual. It's all about yourself. Forget everyone else. But the reality is that we do live in a world where we have to interact with others and we have to be able to to get on with others. Um, that, that's really interesting because what I've read around the subject would suggest that um you know, it's it's not actually so much about the self. It's much more about putting yourself in conformity with the the wider the universe, and therefore the the kind of boundaries of city. They would they would have referred specifically to kind of the nation state are actually meaningless um, because they're not necessarily in conformity with the natural order. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example of the sort of thing I mean in, in practical terms is, for instance, the idea of, of whether or not you should go to a party. Okay. Um, the, the Stoics might say, oh, you know, don't bother. Um, but, but, but in reality, um, the ability to, you know, especially if you're just going, you're a university age and, and you're mm -hmm. just off to university, the, the ability to go to parties is, is quite an important social function. Um, you don't have to go there and get drunk every yeah, week. Yeah, I guess but... I guess he covered that in in one of those rules where he kind of said, you know, look, assess what you are foregoing by doing that. Yeah, check the opportunity and if it cost. still seems to be a reasonable or that you you know you still believe you will derive more pleasure than having not done that, then that's the right thing to do. Yeah. So I, I think they account for that. I I think I'd have well, to. It's, uh, it's it's a difficult one because it's um, he he says that, but then he he remember he had that big one where he's like boom boom mm -hmm. boom all these points, and and he um, I, I can't remember the the exact wording of it, but a lot of them were uh, contradictory to that. Um, let's see if I can find it. Well, I, I guess they deal with realities as well, so they state the kind of the perfect principle, and mm -hmm. then they state look. That's the ideal, but you know, we don't necessarily live in a utopia, and you certainly don't live in a utopia uh, as an individual. And we're progressing towards a state of being. So it may be in that instance that you know it might be reasonable to be there, but here are these other things you can do to kind of um, guard against sullying yourself, if you like. With the <laughs> So, so for instance, he says, um, uh, on the rare occasions when you're called upon to speak, then speak, um, but never about banalities such as gladiators, horses, sports, food and drink, commonplace stuff. Um, although I, you know, I you like say, your football, Jack, don't you? So, I think that it is an ab absurdly valuable social hack, particularly for men. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I I disagree on that point. Okay. No, that's, um, I'm not here to to uh, necessarily defend it's stoicism. Forty something, I think, where he uh, he was given off about talking about the common things like yes. football. 
Yeah. I think it specifically actually says it there, football. Yeah. Definitely, yeah, it's <laughs> specifically the football, yeah. Com- commenting on Manchester United's terrible uh, run. Okay. Well, listen, so uh, th- we've done the first three episodes. Um, I've, I've got... Yeah, I plan this to to be quite a long term thing. So we've got uh, Sen- uh, we've got the discourses of Epictetus, and we've also got Senator uh, Seneca's letters of Senator. a start. I can't mix it mixing words because it's getting late. Um, and I think I'm te- I, w- I would like to explore some of those. Um, they may be shorter episodes, maybe sort of like forty five minutes to an hour, rather than what we've done the last couple of weeks. But I think it would be interesting to explore some of how they would have applied those practically to life and and Seneca is very much in that vein and then after that I think I would like to read the whole of uh of meditations meditations because I think it's um I think for me of the three I find that the most interesting and maybe that's because of the stage in my life that I'm at um, relative to to you two a bit, a bit further it's, on the years. it's the big one isn't it it's the one that um I'd say most people read um mm-hmm. it's it's by far i think the best seller of yeah. the three authors okay well thank you very much for joining me tonight um you are welcome at any time to join in with any of the others or wave jack i i know you'll be busy with your own streams yeah. so um thank you for being on for these two though i think you provided some fascinating insights uh particularly around the context of uh, when when this philosophy is is kind of really at its height yeah well hopefully we'll be able to do a crossover um on the history stream about this subject so people should yes i was, I was going to up. ask if there was anything further you'd like to to promote and i think so y- your first history stream this week is going to be on wellington but yep. in two weeks time you're looking at doing a kind of broader context of uh, stoicism in the ancient Roman world, and yeah. So tomorrow the the history stream starts on Wellington on uh, Arthur Wellesley, and that will be about an hour to an hour and a half. Um, and then in two weeks' time, it'll be episode two, and it will, we're planning on doing it as you say on. I, I've I titled it "The Age of the Antonines." Mm-hmm. Um, because it, it was, of course, uh, that period. Um, although, admittedly, it, um, Seneca was Nero, which is Julio Claudian's, and yes. um, Epictetus was, I think, right at the end of the Flavians. And an Arian who wrote Epictetus was at the start of the Antonines. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, yeah. Aurelius was one of the Antonines. Um, so, but by the way, it, it reached its peak under under the Antonines, and so we'll be exploring the historic context of this stuff, and it will give me a chance to, to not <laughs> only talk about the the philosophy, but just the Romans in general. Because great, yeah, great. Okay, and um, Dave, uh, have you have you anything you'd like to shill? Um, no, pretty much. Right. I, I just, just, I the just NHS. I, well no it, it doesn't need it needs more than a shell it needs um tactical reform but yeah uh get into that on this one no 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 i this, bumper edition nhs stream <laughs> yeah i'll do that sometime okay all right then well thank you chaps we'll we'll end it there thank you for staying on for the the two hours it's, it's Everyone listening, make sure if they haven't done so already to subscribe and to join the Discord and follow us on Twitter. Yes, there are lots of links in the description. Make good use of those. And and yeah, we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye.